So with that, would you join me in prayer, please? Father, we lift this time to you. We come as we are, God, and um, as I am right now, I am just really not feeling well. Um, I'm wondering how much of the sermon I'm going to be able to get through, Lord, but this is your service. This is your time. This is your message. It's your truth, Lord. So speak to us. Whatever words uh, we need to hear, Lord, from you, we pray we would hear them. Give us the ears to hear. Whatever words need to be received and cultivated into our hearts and then lived out, Lord, for each and every one of us, I pray you would speak those words now. Um, And Lord, um, we just long to please you. We pray that you would meet us here this morning, Lord, and grant us a refreshing renewal energy from your spirit and your passion for us and the world, Lord. Give us a glimpse of that passion, Lord. Lord, glancing through the headlines week by week, it's, it's for me at least, it's disheartening to read the headlines, to, he- to see the negativity and... Um, the division that's, that's so rampant, not only in our country, but the world. Yet Jesus Christ is the one who comes to um, not only restore us with you, but restore us with each other. To bring unity and healing and peace. A reconciliation to you first and next to each other as we realize and open our eyes that we are all created in your image, God. And no matter our size, shape, color, background, history, struggles, whatever, God, we are all your people who desire to live to worship for you, worship you. And that is across all boundaries, across all fences, all divisions we try to make as humans, Lord. Jesus reaches out beyond and over and under those divisions to gather us into his people, your people, dear God. And we pray that we would uh, live that out in the choices we make, in the conversations we engage in or choose to not be a part of, Lord, in the grocery store, at the gas station, receiving a paycheck or filling out unemployment forms, Lord. We pray that people would sense your unity, your love, your welcoming, your belonging in each and every one of us, Lord, even without words. And then seek to know that more, to know you more. So we, we, we pray for that, Lord. We pray that 2019 would be a, a wonderful year of um, getting back to uh, cultivating time with you and shining your light in us to others in our communities and wherever you take us, Lord. Those are two simple things that I think maybe our church can be known for in 2019. So we love you. We praise you. Speak to us the message you have for us today in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're in our second week um, of our established series. And as I shared two weeks ago with the first sermon in this series, um, I just felt God prompting me, but all of us as well, to a back to the basics kind of thing uh, to start 2019. 2019 already feels like it's well underway. Um, but sometimes we need to get back to the foundations, check the foundation, sure up joists or whatever, uh, particularly of our faith, as society and the world seeks to topple those, those things, particularly our faith and all things we read about in here. Um, so let's, let's shore up our foundation together. Can we do that? Um, if, you, if you and I are going to be rooted and grounded and established in the love of God, which I pray each and every one of us desires, we're going to have to learn how to listen to God. We're going to have to learn how to hear His voice. In our day and time, if we pray... We're kind of lumped into this spiritual category. If we actually talk to God, maybe we'll be lumped into the super spiritual category. 
But then if we actually say that we hear from God, well, those who don't share our faith might throw in words like crazy or even delusional. I've heard those words. And I would direct those people to our What is Truth and Gospel Truth sermon series, where we discovered and looked at the historical and archaeological and the scientific evidence that supports our faith. We learned that belief in God and following Jesus Christ, yielding to the Holy Spirit in your life, is not a leap of faith. It's not a leap of faith. It's not a letting go of all things rational. It's not a disengagement of our brains. No, it's Christianity is logical. It's rational. It's intelligent. We need to remember that. It's an eternal embrace, a logical acceptance of a heavenly gift in Jesus Christ. Amen? Now, here's the thing. God is still speaking even now. Do you believe that? Do you believe that statement? And God wants you to hear him and wants you to know his voice. In the Bible, many of us, perhaps most of us, think that God spoke way back then. I fell into that trap most of my spiritual journey. God spoke and acted in Bible times. That was then. In modern times, however, is he speaking? Maybe some of us would answer no. Why? I've heard many answers. God has disengaged himself from the world because of the state of things. God doesn't care. God's fed up. God is hurt, I've heard even, and so on. Now just think about this for a moment. Right now, there are conversations going on all around us in the air. Just think about that for a moment. Right now, we can't see them, but there are conversations happening all around us, all swirling throughout the air. There are images in the air as well, but we can't see them. But if you have a cell phone or a computer or a tablet, they can pick up and tap into and even engage in those conversations. If you have a television, it receives the broadcast. So it doesn't make the conversation any less real if you don't have your cell phone with you, right? It's still happening. But in order to engage that conversation, in order to experience the images floating around us, we have to tune into them. So make no mistake, God is still speaking. God is still speaking, and we can hear from him, but we have to learn how to tune into him, which can be quite difficult. We need to learn how to hear the voice of God, and after hearing his voice, we need to learn to understand what he's saying to us to you and me, to each of us personally. And then we need to participate and engage that conversation. Communication. Communication can be a difficult, tricky, even challenging thing, even just amongst human beings, right? So how do we hear the voice of God? How do we tune in? How do we learn to engage and participate in God's dialogue? Well, if you turn in your Bibles, Margot read it beautifully, John chapter 10. Here, Jesus tells us that he wants us to know his voice. Now, in order for us to know his voice, we must become familiar with and listen to his voice. And what does this assume? Well, this assumes daily, rhythmic, devoted time in the Word, with our Savior, with Jesus Christ. John chapter 10, verse 10. Jesus says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come, Jesus says, that they may have life and have it to the full. So the first part of verse 10 the thief coming to destroy and steal and kill. He's talking about who? He's talking about Satan. You and I have a very real enemy that wants to destroy our lives. And that's his goal. How does he do that? Well, his methods haven't changed since the beginning. He's using the same methods over and over and over. Why? 
Well, because he's really good at them. And because he knows us well as human beings. He doesn't need to change his methods because he's been so successful for so long. Jesus calls Satan the father of lies, and what does this mean? Well, in order to lie, you have to speak. So now we have another voice fighting for our attention. And Satan will do anything. He will say anything to try and engage us to tune into him, not God. Satan's speaking. He's telling lies. But God is speaking too. Only God is broadcasting and speaking truth. So all the more reason we need to be tuning in to God. Amen? How do we discern the different voices? Sometimes it's hard to do so. How do we discern the voice of God? How do we discern the truth and what we hear and what we're receiving? How do we tune out Satan? Well, let's see what Jesus says. We just read it. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. The second half of verse 10. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. Life to the full. Let's just stop there for a moment. Jesus says you have an enemy. We have an enemy. And the enemy wants to destroy your life. He's the father of lies. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy your life. But Jesus has come to give life to each and every one of us. And not just life, but he says life to the full. It's a profound statement. The original Greek word used for full is parason. Sometimes it's nice to hear these ancient words, isn't it? Parason. What a beautiful, packed, rich word. I love this word. The idea here is life to the max and even beyond. Life in abundance, divine life, blissful life, extraordinary life. This is the life Jesus Christ wants for you, for you, for you, for you, and for me, for all of us. Divine life, extraordinary life. Now, as Jesus continues to teach, he says, if we're going to have an abundant life, a parasone life, we've got to learn to hear his voice. Skip down to verse 27 if you have your Bibles open. Jesus says, what does he say? My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. They're tuned in. He goes on, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than them all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Comforting words. Jesus is the shepherd in the illustration, right? Well, we are the sheep, and we're to know his voice, we're to tune into his voice, and we're to follow him. Now, if you've said yes to Jesus, that's a forever thing. Don't ever forget that. Many other people who call themselves pastors might tell you otherwise. But Scripture tells us that if Jesus is our shepherd, that's forever. And he just said multiple times, nothing can snatch us away from that relationship, that truth, that reality. So we know his voice. We tune into his voice. We follow him. And there's nothing, nothing that we could ever do, nothing I could ever do, nothing you could ever do, nothing anyone could ever do to snatch you out of that relationship with Jesus Christ. Praise God. Hallelujah. The work of Christ in your life is an eternal forever thing. Jesus and the Father are one. You are reconciled with God. You are a child of God. No one can redefine that. Praise God. If you want to know what God is like, if you want to know his personality, how he would respond to certain things that maybe we're dealing with today in the world, in our lives, in our homes, in church, Scripture tells us to look to Jesus, who says, I and the Father are one. So if you want to know the voice of God, you've got to understand, know, and tune into who Jesus is. And we must know his voice 
in order to follow him successfully. And the result of that, again, is life extraordinary, life abundant, life eternal, life to the full, a parasol life. Don't you want a parasol life? I do. Now, there's a couple of simple things here in this passage of Scripture that I just want us to focus on. Uh, number one, God wants you to know his voice. This is very simple, friends, because he loves you. Sometimes we just need to remember the simple things in order to take the next breath, to take the next step, to live, right? God is not absent. God is not disappointed. God is not distracted. God's not playing where's Waldo with you. Hallelujah. The Bible says that God is not the author of confusion. The Psalms tell us that he knows every hair on our heads. How little we have, he knows how many. He speaks and he's even now speaking in a very clear way. God is the author of clarity. So no doubt he's tuned in to us. Isn't that amazing? The author of the universe, the author of all things, tunes into our personal lives because he desires to know us, because he loves us. For some of us, this is a big deal. For me, that's a big deal. But maybe for some of us, this might be a major decision. You're not alone. Maybe some of us are asking, do I take this next job? Or, or do I take that job that that person's offering me? God, where are you in this decision? Some of us might be asking, I'm struggling in my marriage, God. I'm not real sure what the next step is. What are you saying to me? I need to hear you, God. Or maybe you're struggling as a, as a single adult and you've been dating someone for a while and you're wondering, God, is this the one? Time's a ticking, God. Hello? God, help me. This is beyond academic. This is beyond X, Y, and Z for some of us. This is one of those life moments that maybe some of us are facing. And we need to tune into God. Now, if that's you, just know that God loves you. He loves you. As you're facing these questions, as you're struggling through life, as you're sweating over this or that, God loves you now, right where you are. We need to tune in. In fact, there's just five simple ways. You don't have to write them down. I don't think I make you write them down, hopefully. No, I think I just list them for you. I want this to be easy. No, they're all listed in your sermon notes. You don't need to write these down. Five simple things that God communicates to us. There's one moment in the Bible when he actually speaks and people hear. His hand literally shows up on a wall and, and, and writes, which, by the way, is where that saying, the writing on the wall, came from. Another time, God spoke through a donkey. Literally, a donkey started talking. Take that, Dr. Doolittle. So if God can speak through a donkey, don't you think he can speak to us? So here are five main ways that God speaks in our daily, in our day and time. First way is through the Bible. This is the major way God communicates to us, his people. It's the primary way he speaks. And that's why we need to tune into this as often as possible. As often as we can, it's vital, it's paramount, it's the key to tuning into God's voice. I'm saying this to myself too. This may sound very basic, but it's so important that we realize and remind ourselves of the basics. The Bible is God's love letter to us. God's will is found in his word. Many of us need to stop looking for a sign and, and look for a verse. I've been there. The more we know our Bibles, the more we will know God, the more we'll be able to, to discern God's voice when he speaks to us. Our devotion time needs to go deeper. More than flipping and pecking. Do you know what I mean by that? You all know what I mean? I used to do this. You have your Bible in front of you, and you cry out to God, Father, give me a verse for the day. You close your eyes, and you hastily just flip through the pages and point, and that's the verse. I used to do this. That was my devotion time, just flip and peck 
That's what one of my professors used to say. Devotion time with God has to go deeper than that. Amen? There's a story of a guy who was really wanting direction in his life from God. So he took the Bible and thumbed through it and pointed to a verse without looking and, and, and said, God, I need a word from you. He flipped and pecked. Give me a verse. And he looked and the verse said, Judas went and hung himself. And the guy said, that can't be right. Let, let's try again. I'll give you a mulligan, God. So he flipped and pecked again. And the next verse said, go and do likewise. <laughs> Third time's a charm, God. He tried it again, and, and that next verse said, what you do, you must do in a hurry. <laughs> you get the idea. Flipping and pecking can be pointless, but it can be dangerous too, Right? I mean, depending on this guy's state of mind, depending on his heart, depending on his life circumstances, the choices he made, that now maybe he's reaping some of those choices and he's doing this, what if he actually believed that this was God telling him to go hang himself? Well, if he knows his Bible, and we pray that we do, he knows that Jesus has come to restore and make things new. He's the author of life. So he would... Tune into God's voice and tune out the lies of Satan. Satan knows Scripture well. He knows it better than we do. But Jesus' first line of defense when he was tempted was what? Scripture. And that caused Satan to flee. We have to remember that. So we have to go deeper. Time with God is relational. It's a relationship. It's a living, breathing, flowing relationship. And like any relationship, it takes an investment on our part of time and energy. If you want a healthy marriage, you invest in time with your spouse. So important. If you want a healthy relationship with your son or daughter, you invest time in them. Devote time to your family. We need to do that with God, our Father. You see the difference between flipping and pecking and going a little deeper than that. The second way God will speak with you is through authority. This is one I think that maybe... Maybe we've forgotten in our day and age. The, the Bible is the main authority. Amen. So we submit to Scripture. God will speak to you through authority, such as through pastors and elders. In the church, pastors and leaders have authority. But please hear me. Just because the elders and I have authority, that doesn't make us any more special than you. Okay? It just means that we have a different role in the church than you. God simply gifted us to be pastors and leaders. Our gifts are no better than what he gifted you. Scripture says that we, elders and pastors, because of the role God placed us in this church, we have a, a heavier responsibility. In the book of James, which we just walked through, some of you may remember, James literally asks, why would anyone want to be a pastor? Because pastors, elders, leaders, deacons, Ministry leaders are going to be judged a little more strictly, a little more thoroughly than the average person. So that also means that we as pastors and elders and leaders, we need to constantly and devotedly, we need to be checking ourselves. Right? That's a huge responsibility with God. God takes that super seriously. So should we. We need accountability. We need spiritual sensitivity, daily devoted time with God and God will speak to you through us, we better well make sure that we ourselves are humble and sensitive enough to God's voice and His leading in our lives. It's a huge responsibility. So I would ask for prayer for our elders. I would ask for prayers for me as I pray for you and as I pray for the elders. Uh, the Bible says in Romans chapter 13 that the government is an authority. Now, that it's God's will for us to obey the law of the land, that's scriptural. So, for instance, when you're driving and the posted speed limit is 65, God's will for you in that moment, trip, <laughs> is to drive 65. Period. And scripture is very clear. The law of the land ultimately is ordained, should be, by God. All the more reason for us to pray for our government. 
nationally, locally, our communal government, in our communities? Are we praying daily for our leaders, these authorities? Are they yielding to God in their decisions, in their legislation? All the more reason to pray. Amen? If you're a student and you live at home, your parents would be godly authority in your life. We need to be praying for those situations too. In fact, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5 that if you obey your parents, it's good for you. It will help you live a long and healthy life. Parents are and should be godly authority. If you have a job, your employer, Scripture tells us, is a godly authority. Should be a godly authority. If you're married, your spouse is a godly authority in your life. Now, if you're thinking about this passage that says, Wives, submit to your husbands. Yes, it would include that verse too. And we actually looked at it a while ago in our Ephesians series. That verse is in Ephesians chapter 5 as well. Now, most men who've been in church for seven minutes or less, they know that verse all too well. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. But do you remember what we learned in that verse, in that passage? Here's a prime example of the importance of context. Again, all the more reason to know this more and know its context Just before the verse, Paul says to submit to each other out of reverence for Christ. Submit to each other out of reverence for Christ. That's where the word submit occurs. That's the context of the word submit, mutual submission. So marriage is a commitment of mutual submission. When we read the rest of Ephesians 5, Paul is saying husbands in light of mutual submission, here's your role. Wives, in light of mutual submission, here's your role. Gentlemen, God will speak to you through your wife. Do you believe that? I do. When I sense God speaking through Micheline, no matter what I'm feeling, no matter how angry I am, how entitled I think I am, I make myself shut up and listen. (laughs) Thank you, Judy. If it's from God, it will be according to God's word. If he uses a donkey, he will use your spouse to speak to you. I didn't say wife. If your wife is a follower of Jesus, listen to her. I've gotten so much wisdom from Micheline in crisis situations. I praise God for her every day. I thank God for her. The beginning of the day, throughout the day, the end of the day. I tell her I thank God for her every day. She has spoken godly wisdom to me and continues to. Ladies, if your husband is a follower of Jesus Christ, and I pray he is, God will speak to you through him. If you're having marital conversation and and, and there's conviction, you know, you just kind of sense that something profound is going on here. God is there and God is speaking. So not only do we need to acknowledge that, we need to submit to that and praise him for it. And thank God for each other in that moment as well. Amen. So since we're talking about marriage, here's a little bonus when there's confrontation in your relationship. Anytime there's confrontation, it's always a good thing to stop and pray. I'm learning this too. Anytime there's confrontation, it'd be a good thing to stop and pray. You won't feel like praying. I won't feel like praying. You don't want to pray at that moment, but if you just take your spouse's hand at that moment and pray, you will begin to mutually submit yourselves before God, before your Creator. And God will honor that. 
and bless that. And the atmosphere will change. I've seen this happen time and time again. I promise you. Because Jesus doesn't take sides. He takes over. That's what Andy Stanley says. Wise words. So God will speak to you through authority, government, parents, pastors, employers, your spouse. Are you listening? Are you ready to listen? So if you're here today and and you have authority in one form or another, you want to make sure that you're under God's authority. That's key. That's vital. If you're a parent, if you're a leader, if you're a boss, if you're an employer, if you're a pastor, if you're an elder, if you have a problem submitting to authority, then you shouldn't be in authority. And that's not me saying this. That's what this says. That's what Scripture says. Thirdly, God can speak through others in faith. The truth is, when we're making life decisions, we shouldn't be seeking each other. No, we should be seeking each other for godly wisdom. (laughs) When we're making life decisions, we need to break out of our crisis mode and seek wisely counsel from each other. Amen? We need each other. We need to be sharing life together. But we need to seek counsel from those who share our faith, first and foremost. Now, if a bunch of godly Christ-following people are in disagreement with you, and you choose to go out and seek the counsel of a non-believing friend who actually ends up agreeing with you, well, then I'm sorry, uh, you're not listening to God. (laughs) I've done that, by the way. You're rationalizing. You're, you're trying to find someone who will tell you what you want to hear rather than seeking the one whose counsel and advice should be paramount. So how do you know if you're receiving godly counsel? How do you know if you're listening to God in your friends? Well, they're following Jesus for one. They attend church regularly. They know the Bible and spend regular time in it. They're humble, which is key. Humility key to the Christian life. It's the chief virtue of the Christian life. First Peter chapter 5, verse 5 says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Find humble people to share life with, humble people who know that you are following Jesus and who care more about your future than your feelings. You want people who will tell you the truth whether you want to hear it or not. That's the kind of counsel we should be seeking Now, this is a verse that would be great to memorize. Proverbs 13, 20. Walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. So if you want to be wise, if you want to be godly, if that's a characteristic you want to cultivate in your life, if you want to know the voice of God and live and share your life with people who are wise, godly, and know the voice of God, that's how you cultivate that characteristic. That's what Scripture just told us. Apparently, we become like those who we spend time with. If I'm thinking, man, all my friends are idiots. I'm not thinking that, by the way. Well, what does that say about me, right? Me, who's choosing to spend time with this ragtag crew. So choose to put yourself in a place where you get regular godly counsel from people who love God and love you. Amen? Feed your mind with godly wisdom, first with scripture, but then with good Christian books written by people who know the voice of God, by godly people. They're out there. They are, even on Amazon, friends. Listen to good sermons. Watch good movies with godly messages. Those are out there, too. They're coming more and more, actually, into our cinemas. Christianity Today is a wonderful magazine. Wonderful magazine. Fantastic articles by some of the greatest minds of our faith. I'm always updating our resources page on our website with Bible and devotion apps, so check that too. Good websites for research and study. Check back regularly. I'm constantly updating. Wonderful, trusted resources for us to feast on. The fourth way God speaks to us is through his still small voice. Sometimes we have to quiet ourselves to hear him. What does that mean? Every once in a while, the Holy Spirit, if you're a follower of Jesus, will prompt you and nudge you. You'll be going through your day and someone will come to mind suddenly. 
And this happens to me all the time, and it seems sort of random, but you can't shake that thought. You can't shake that person out of your mind. And perhaps it's God speaking to you in his still small voice. He's going to nudge you in certain directions, give you inklings, gut feelings. He will impress upon you certain things. Again now, how do you know it's God? How do you know it's not your own mind? How do you know it's not the enemy, the one who comes to steal, kill, destroy? How do you know it's the pizza you didn't eat last night? Scrooge asks that question (laughs) when Jacob Marley appears. How do you know it's not the one who wants to steal, kill, and destroy when you get those promptings and nudges? Pray. That's our first line of defense. should be reflexive in any choice, anything we do. Anything we seek, any decision, we need to go to prayer. All, always, first and foremost, pray to God and ask for his wisdom and discernment. What does scripture say about what or how I'm feeling? Is there a verse for that? There probably is. Are you spending enough time in scripture to recall those verses? Talk to godly friends, people with whom you're sharing life. Ask some authority in your life. Run it through this grid that we're learning of how to seek godly counsel. We're too good at rationalizing. I know I am. When we rationalize, what are we doing? We're we're, we're telling ourselves rational, seemingly logical lies. A lie is a lie, family. Are there good lies? White lies? Justifiable lies? This tells us no. A lie is a lie. And those are oxymoronic statements. Any lie is a lie in God's eye. Any lie is a sin. And no one's going to lie to you more than you. More than me to myself. We're all self-deceived on some level. There's an old proverb, not from the Bible, but it's very applicable here. The eye cannot see the eye. We need each other to look into our lives and make sure that we're not deceiving ourselves. Amen. Lastly, number five, God will speak to you through circumstances. Ever heard the phrase, uh, an open door or a closed door? A lot of, it's in a lot of our churches nowadays, open doors, closed doors. God opened this door. God closed that door. Of the five we've just learned, I found this one to be the least reliable from my point of view. It comes from something that happened to Paul in the New Testament. But people often take it out of context. So usually an open door means it's easy from our perspective, right? Oh, this is easy. It's an open door, so God just wants me to do this. We have to remember that most of the time when God speaks to us, it's not going to be easy, right? It's, not, it's going to be difficult. That's how he grows us. That's how he matures us. That's how he prepares us for heaven for some mysterious reason. I've said this before, how we live down here prepares us for life up there in eternity. So remember, how we live down here on earth prepares us in some mysterious way for eternity in heaven. What does the Bible say? What does authority say? What do godly friends say? What is God prompting us to do? Don't get caught in the open door, closed door trap. Don't use it as an excuse to avoid something challenging as I have done in the past something difficult. Don't ignore God. Galatians chapter 6 verse 7, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. And know that we are here for you, no matter what you're going through. You're not alone, okay? If God is challenging you or leading you through a difficult season in order to grow you, we are here for you. We're here for you to lean on if needs be, because at some point we might need you for something we're going through. So use us, please. And so back to our main points. First, God wants you to know his voice. Next point, we're almost done. In order to know his voice, we have to know the shepherd. Kind of a no-brainer there. Again, back to the basics. I know these are basic, but we need to hear this. Spend time with God. You'll learn his voice. It's that simple. So I'm going to date myself here, but in the days before cell phones and caller ID, yes, there was a life before texting, tweeting, and messaging, if you can believe that, you younger folk. But in the dark ages, 
when we had to call people with corded phones mounted on the wall. I remember being amazed when my friends answered. And I said, hello, and asked for my friend. Hi, is Alec there? Most of the time I would hear, oh, hi, Trip. How are you? I didn't even say my name. They immediately knew it was me, and I haven't even identified myself at this point. Always caught me off guard. How did they know it was me? I asked them, oh, I know it's you from your voice. They knew my voice. Well, the more you spend time with God, the more you're in church, the more you listen to sermons, the more that you're around godly friends sharing life with each other, the more you get to know Jesus Christ, the shepherd, the more you're going to be able to discern and know his voice. You know, when Jesus talks about shepherding, it's a different picture than what we think it is nowadays. You know, in in the West today, we shepherd with sheepdogs. The dogs force the sheep where they're supposed to go. How do they do this? The dogs scare the sheep. They run at them and bark at them and growl at them. And then the herders are on the horses and they literally push the sheep in the direction they want to go. And that's absolutely not the kind of shepherding that Jesus does with us. I hope you all know that. Jesus is never going to bark at you. Jesus is never going to scare at you, scare you. That's just not how he speaks. That's not who he is. That's not how he works. Praise God. When Jesus talks about shepherding his sheep, here's how shepherds would shepherd in biblical times, in the Middle East during this time. A lamb would be born in a flock, and the shepherd, after the birth of the lamb, would take the lamb and put the lamb on his shoulders. And would walk around with the lamb for a few days. I didn't know this. Now, in doing this, the little lamb got to know and trust the shepherd's voice. The lamb got to hear the sounds of the flock that it was joining. And after a period of time, the shepherd would take the lamb and return it to the flock. The lamb would intimately know the voice of the shepherd by that point. In ancient Middle East, shepherds could just literally walk in front of the sheep and call them gently, and the sheep would follow. Why? Because they knew and trusted the shepherd's voice. So if you want to know the voice of God, allow him to take you on his shoulders. Some some of us need that, don't we? To just stop for a little bit. There's just too much going on. Lord, can you carry me? He does that. We have to spend time with him. That's it. The ball's in your court, friends. I have no note for this. The next step. The ball is in your court. I can't tell you how to make time. I don't want to tell you how to make time. I don't want to. I'm not here to do that, to tell you what to do. But the reality is, the more we spend time with him, the more we choose time with him, the more we'll be able to recognize him as he speaks to us. And he is speaking to us. So spend time with God so that you will know and trust the voice of God. You'll be far more likely to follow him as he leads you and calls to you. Next week, we'll continue to establish ourselves in God's love and security as we explore talking with God, okay? God bless each and every one of you. I'm sorry we went a little long today, but stay for the fellowship meal and fill up your tummies. And be healthy, too. God bless you. Amen.